my name is um, Yvonne Jones, and um, I've come here as part of a staff member with the Racial Justice Network. And this, I work with the Blackboard, and myself and a group of other few people um, have been around talking about racial inequality. Um, hello everyone. Um, I can't see anything. There's not a lot of pointing at me. Um, so, uh, my name is Rinka Grau. Unfortunately, that is not a Welsh name. I wish it was. Um, it's Bosnian. I'm from Sarajevo. I've been here for 20, more than 20 years. And um, I now run an organization called Migrant Refugee Communities Forum here in London. And I'm what you would probably say the ungrateful one. Um, I keep repeating to myself that I'm in a public place and this is being recorded because I'm so pissed off that I have to talk about this, I'm not going to say the word, 20 years on. I'm really, really angry. And that anger is what is driving me. The polite way of saying it would be that I'm passionate about human rights and equality. Well, maybe I am and maybe I will become, but um, the situation is so bad and so urgent that we fucking have to do something about this. It has not been this bad for 20 years. And I have survived the war. I've spent 18 months in Sarajevo under the siege. So I know what I'm talking about. And what I'm talking about is that on the 27th, I was in the Islington Town Hall talking about my experience as a survivor of war on the um, Holocaust Memorial Day. There are two idiots on trial in the Hague for genocide that happened in my country. The verdicts might come in this year, 23 years waiting for that verdict. Before the war, I used to be a journalist. I was a radio person for five years. And I must say, I was really a privileged, elitist, and cynical. And I used to rush home to watch these idiots give speeches in Parliament and laugh at them in a similar way that people laugh at Nigel these days and don't take him seriously. And I'm not a fun person at all when I say this. But there is there is a paper on Google it. It's called Eight Stages of Genocide. And the stage three is dehumanization. And I have been dehumanized as an immigrant, as a refugee, beyond what is acceptable. And now I'm at the point where I'm not only stealing your jobs and the houses and your husbands and my children are obstructing your children in education system. I'm also clogging up M25 so Nigel can't make it to the whales and I'm probably ruining the weather. So you can see how pissed off I am because it's not having any effect. Nigel is still up and running. And I think one of, one of the things that is really important for me and why I'm here is not only as a therapy session for my anger, but also because I've made this journey of the last 23 years from cynic to true believer. Because I have seen change happen. And I truly believe that it's possible. And I walk around my office and I say, we're going to be the kingmaker in the next mayoral elections, and of course they will think I'm crazy. But I will be vindicated Monday, perhaps not in 2016, but very soon, because there are three million of us in London, and we can all vote. So that's what I'm doing at the moment, apart from dealing with all sorts of misery from all around the world that is inflicted on people by people whose wages we pay and people who we elect. I'm also doing voter registration, and my work is going to start on the 8th of May. It's not going to finish on the 7th. Um, how do I have to that? Um, I'd say 
I like the word you use, anger, because I think, for me personally, anger drives me, because I've been asked quite a few times by people, why do you do what you do? And I think a lot of it is the fact that I'm still experiencing the same things um, I'm still experiencing being treated differently. I'm still seeing people like me being treated differently. So the anger and the fact that I think I'm human before I'm a black woman, I'm human before I'm a woman, um, should be the reason why I get what everybody else is getting. And for me, in terms of belief, because I like the fact you said you, you actually believe that there is, it's possible to change. What I've come to learn over the last maybe five years is there are a lot of people that aren't aware of what goes on for people like us that they don't know that you will get treated differently when you're queuing up you get treated differently when you apply for jobs because people are so blind to it they don't think it exists so part of my job i think is to actually make people aware that these things do exist we're in the 21st century that these things do exist but also to help empower my community as well because I think we've been trodden for so long that you kind of get there's this thing around self loathing where you kind of just want to bury your head and carry on. You're not getting promoted at work, you're not getting anywhere in a lot of things, but you just kind of just keep going and don't say anything, don't get attention, don't, pay, don't make people stand or stop and think twice. You just carry on. So for me, there's also a message around encouraging people like us to stand and say it, call it out. If you think this is the reason why you're being treated like this and actually speak out because for the fact that most people haven't spoken out means a lot of people in public I've met haven't um, been made aware. The other reason is also, I think it's also my duty to tell people that, that they've got privilege because um, when it's, we had a session in a in a in a campaign lab that I've been doing and met fantastic people like Dan, and uh, we had a session around privilege. And at first, it was very uncomfortable for people, say white male, uh, middle class, to acknowledge and think, no, I'm not. But actually, when you sort of sat down and talked it through, a lot of people actually acknowledge they've got privilege. And it's not that you kind of then, because you've got it, be embarrassed about it. It's how you turn it and you become a better ally to people like us who are suffering because of the ident identities we hold. Um, I came here um, as, um, I think, in my late teens. And I think, I keep saying this as a story that I wasn't aware of my identity because I'd grown up in Kenya, happy and everything was going fine, and then I've landed in London and then up in Lancashire, in Blackburn, and it felt the identity was imposed on me. I didn't ask for it because I was just used to being me wherever I am. But when you're standing now, you're a minority, and then people, because of that, ask you questions, sometimes sensitive, sometimes not, but because of it, then I realised it's not me that's coming and said I want to be treated differently. It's people that treated me differently that made me react. And that reaction is what still propel, propels me till now because I think there's something to be said about what happens. And I think for people here in the audience, having organisations doing what we're doing today, I think is a really good thing. But people in the audience, is just to look around you, look at work, look at in the schools. And when you hear the conversation, I just like what you said about we're blamed for everything, blamed for the fact that schools have got a hundred and something languages being spoken and none of them are first, you know, English is not the first language. Because I think we've come so far in terms of why people are here. I think it's the short termism of, say, imperialism, colonialism, slavery, and all that that's impacted to the fact that these nations out there that haven't got what would say is equal, that is making people come here. So when they come here and kicking off and making me feel like I should feel grateful for the opportunity to get through the immigration and da da da, I think no actually, because of what happened back then is the reason why people are here. There's reasons and things somebody, the guys were here before saying about the wars going on. You'll hear people kicking off after about the, what's the guys coming from Iraq guys from, from Syria, from wherever else. But actually, what we're doing now that is making people be, 
end up coming here and then kicking off about people coming here. Yeah. So I think and whilst they're here, this thing about they're different from us because we've had the generations where the third, fourth generation, because they're of a different colour, because they're of a different race, they're still treated as the other, even though somebody else who's kind of blends in easily um, isn't seen as the other person. So I think there's something to be said for people that say kick off and say they should be here, they should be no, we should be here because of things that have been done and people should accept that and also carry on treating people not unequally but treat them as humans. And I just perhaps because we're running out of time, I'd like to say the, the good news is diversity is actually our strength. And there's something called the London effect, and that's that kids are doing much better, and London schools are doing much better, and the only um, reason that the researchers could find is because of immigrant children and because of diversity. And that's something to celebrate and not to complain about. And there are a number of things that, I mean, I, and I think that part of that diversity also involves that bigots have representation and voice. You know, I used to be a journalist, I like freedom of speech, and if, if someone really needs representation and is voiceless, that's really white um, male bigots. So, so, you know, welcome to diversity. But there are a number of things that we could and should be doing, and that's taking this seriously and also taking piss out of some of these things. And um, I'd like to share with you three campaigns that I'm working on right now. One is called 5050, and that's to persuade 50 local authorities around the country to take only 50 Syrian refugees each. And only one local authority so far has agreed, and that's Kingston, Royal Borough of Kingston. So get writing to your leaders and your councillors. The next one is um, to stop indefinite attention of people and immigration. And that is, I know most people here will know about it, but uh, the rest of the country doesn't. And people can't believe that you can be sent by civil servant down with no judicial overview for a prolonged period of time until you actually go away. And if you can't go away, you can be locked up forever. And that's absolutely disgraceful. And it's unnecessary. And the third campaign is, is to actually reduce income threshold for people who fall in love with foreigners, and I know that's hard to believe, but there are people like that, um, so that they don't have to make more than living wage. At the moment, if, you, if you're in love with someone outside the EU, you have to be making 18600 and then extra money for each child that you might be having. And I think it's a, the hypocrisy of not, I mean, it should really be a minimum wage, not even a living wage, but let's settle for living wage. Um, and there is absolutely no need to do that. And just as a woman, which is also another part of um, minority identity, more than 60% of women in this country do not make 18,600 pounds. So I'm not a single issue campaigner because all of these campaigns are linked. I have to stop now. I'm going to see if anybody wanted to ask a question back to There's no questions. Thank you.